Today, I want to talk to you around this idea of being steadfast. Everybody say steadfast. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 58, we'll talk a little more about this next week. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, we're going New King James on you here, uh, be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. So whatever you do for God is never forgotten. Uh, and may, excuse me, it may not be noticed by man, but it's always noticed by God. Uh, he keeps the accounts, and one day he'll reward us for everything that we do in his name. The Bible says, stay steadfast, and it means this, to be firm in belief, determination, resolute, unwavering, in purpose, and in loyalty. The term steadfast in the original language just basically means not move, that you're not being uh, moved by what you see, by what you feel, by what is going on around you. You're only moved by your faith and what the Spirit of God is telling you on the inside. And so we've made these declarations as we head into this year of 2024 that we will be steadfast. We, we will not be moved by popular opinion or persecution. We will not shrink back in the face of fear. We will stand on the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we're going back today to uh, a familiar passage. I, I preached a version of this message uh, about two years ago, and I just felt led of the Holy Spirit, and we're gonna go a different uh, direction next week. But uh, as we're setting up vision for this year to talk about a story that many of you uh, may have heard, maybe you grew up in church, this may be all new to you. It's a story found in Daniel chapter three. Now, the book of Daniel was written by the prophet Daniel. It's named after him. The first six chapters are all about his life. You'll uh, recall that uh, there was a prophetic word that was given that Judah was going to be judged and the people of God in that land were going to be taken from their land and they're going to be, uh, be servants and slaves in Babylon. And uh, it was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah. Now, it was during a time where they were having a national revival. I mean, amazing things were happening, but they got so comfortable in themselves that they gave away the truth of God and they began to worship and serve idols and God judged them. And uh, the best and the brightest were brought from Judah to Babylon to serve at the pleasure of the king. Uh, the one uh, man's name who was uh, a part of that, his name was Daniel. He had three other friends that are mentioned in these first few chapters, and that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And if you ever watch Veggie Tales, it's Rack, Shack, and Benny. Now, the first six chapters are about Daniel's life. The next six chapters are about the prophetic things that are happening right now in our culture and in our day. They are very specific in nature. They tell of the nations that will come together that will be against the Jewish people exactly as you're witnessing in this day. Now, Daniel saw the same vision that John saw in the Isle of Patmos where he wrote the book of Revelation. Same vision, different perspective. They complete one another, and it's a reminder to us to be ready, that this life is not, there's more to this life than this life. The Bible is alive, living, and active and it's very relevant to everything that we experience and live and deal with today. Now, uh, the scripture goes on to tell us about uh, something that, that happens, and I want to set it up just for a few moments uh, for a few moments today. See, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had no, no idea as young teens that they would be ripped from their homeland and brought in the service uh, of another uh, people group in a, in a wicked and evil nation. It's interesting how things seem to parallel over time. I've heard it said that history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And we know that the Bible says that the Jewish people would be hated throughout history. The most persecuted, hated people group in the history of humanity. 15 million people on the face of the earth out of 7 billion, yet the focus of, of world peace is still a tiny little land and people group with a promise from God that's still just as relevant today as it was then. Now, the Bible says that Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, they were brought into service of the king. 
They were taught uh, the witchcraft. They were forced with, uh, with mandates and ideologies that they did not agree with. And they had, to make, they had to make a decision. In Daniel chapter 1, they came and they would not eat the food that was sacrificed to idols. They were invited to eat from the king's table. Now, that was good food. It was like going, you could either eat McDonald's or Ruth Chris Steakhouse. And how many of you know I'm going to the steakhouse? Anybody coming with me? The problem was is that the food that was at the steakhouse was food that was actually idol worship to demon gods. And they said, I'm sorry, we can't do that. We can't worship in that way. We can't have that food. We're not trying to be offensive. I know that we're here and you can kill us, but go ahead if you need to. We're not honoring your God. They made a decision early on that they were not going to serve themselves. They, not, they were not going to obey the opinions of men. They were going to honor the Lord. Now you fast forward and the Bible says they were renamed. Daniel, his name was changed to Belshazzar, which means Bel protect his life. One of the demon gods of Babylon. Uh, they changed Hananiah, which meant Yahweh was gracious to Shadrach, meaning the command of Aku, which was the Babylonian moon god. Mishael, which uh, changed to uh, Meshach, meaning who, is a, who Aku is. So it went from who is like our Lord or who is God to who is like this demon god. Then they changed Azariah, which meant Yahweh is my helper, to Abednego, which meant servant of Nebo, after another demon god. Because culture will always try to change your identity from what God says it is to what they want it to be. We see that pervasive. Don't worry, I'm gonna be real specific, possibly offensive, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you something that's gonna help you fulfill the destiny and the plan that God has for your life, not the opinions of men or the pressure of the culture of the moment. They were being mandated or required to do something they didn't want to do. And they made a decision that they were not going to, well, as we'll talk about in a few moments, they were not going to bow. Now, Babylon is interesting because it goes back to Genesis chapter 11. It's the story of the Tower of Babel where a... Uh, where a spirit, uh, an antichrist spirit that's been pervasive throughout history, but at that time they came together and they, they tried to build uh, ultimately this, this, this building or this tower to the heavens. It was their way of saying, we don't need God. They were creating their own pathway, uh, their own way for them to be saved, where they would be God. And the Bible says that God judged, judged them, confused their language, and scattered them all over the world. Now that spirit is alive and well. We see it show up in the book of Daniel where they said, we're not going to serve your God. We're going to do what we want to do. And not only does it show up uh, in, in, in the book of Daniel in Babylon, but it shows up in the book of Revelation where it's mentioned again, where it's a spirit. That same spirit shows up in Nazi Germany where it says, we're going to do what we want to do regardless of what God says. That same uh, spirit shows up in places like North Korea, which goes against God. And if we're not careful, that same spirit can show up in our own hearts where we, we determine that we are our own savior and will live however we want to live. And so it's within that framework that I want to take you to a story that you may be familiar with. I'm going to read it to you, and then I'm going to comment, commentate on it, and I'm going, to, I'm going to teach you some things. I'm going to challenge some things, maybe even offend some of the things that you believe to shake you today, because listen, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. You need to know that as you trust in the Lord, to come hell or high water, you're going to be okay. God is for you, not against you. You, and you're going to make it. The Lord, your God is with you. But you also need to understand that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. As we look in the world around us, all the different things that are continuing to happen, and you'll see in the coming days, you don't need to live in fear, but you do need to grow in faith. So how do you stay steadfast? Daniel chapter three, beginning in verse one. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and nine feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura, the explorer. do 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 to dora I always want to do that. Anybody watch that before, ever? <laughs> I took years of Spanish in school and I pretty much learned more on Dora, the explorer, my kids growing up, than I did. Anyway, let's continue. In the province of Babylon, 
Then he sent messages to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue that he had set up. So all these officials came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar set up. Then a herald shouted out, people of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, and the zither, how many of you played the zither in high school? Come on, where are you? (laughs) I don't know what that is, but it sounds fun, doesn't it? I am really good at the kazoo. That was about it. But the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and the other musical instruments uh, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone, everybody say anyone, who refuses to obey will be immediately thrown into the blazing furnace. We will have a cookout and your honor, and you will be the meat. I mean, it's, this was an awkward moment, and they're like, okay, tell us what we have to do. And he said, whenever the music plays, just bow your knee. You just go along to get along. Don't care what you believe. You can walk away from here, and you can believe it tomorrow, but when the music plays, you're gonna bow your knee. It's the spirit of Babylon, an antichrist spirit that's alive and well at your workplace, at your school, on TV, social media, in relationships, that you go along to get along, and don't you dare go against the narrative of the moment. You bow your knee, or we'll censor you, we'll cancel you, we'll persecute you, you won't be able to stand. Let's continue. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed to the ground, and they worshiped the gold statue that King Nebi had set up. But some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews. They said, hey, King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king with a really long, ridiculous name. I added that part. And they issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the God or the gold statue. And when they hear the sound of the, the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, lyre, the harp, the pipes, and other musical instruments, that decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into the blazing furnace. Verse 12, listen to this. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Rakshak and Benny, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods, and they do not worship the gold statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego brought before him, and when they were brought, when they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I've set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I've made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. Come on, parents, where are you? How many of you have ever done that before? I'm gonna count to three, and you better stop hitting your brother. I'm gonna count to three, and you better stop doing that. It's actually not good to do because it trains your kids to like for slow obedience, but if we're honest, most of us had done that just because we didn't feel like correcting them, and we were hoping that they would correct themselves. Come on, parents, where, where are you? Yeah, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So it's in that moment. He said, if you refuse... Uh, no big deal, you'll be immediately thrown into the blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you. If we're uh, thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, We want to make it clear to you, we're going to say it in English, we'll say it in your language, we'll use sign language, we'll write it down, whatever you need. We want to make it clear to you that we will never, ever, never serve your false, wicked demon God and worship the gold statue that you set up. How many of you have ever had a moment right there? And the Bible says Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. Come on, how many of you that happened to you this week? You're just like, come on, how many of you, come on, just turn to your neighbor and just do that to them, right? This this is what it looked like. You're yelling at the dog, at your kid, at your spouse, at yourself. Your face became distorted with rage. That's That's where Nebuchadnezzar was. So not a good moment. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. 
So in other words, it was already a few hundred degrees, but now they're going to heat it up to 1,800 degrees. It wasn't enough that they were going to fry instantly. He wanted it to be like the worst flame they could ever uh, experience and be in. Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up, threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and garments. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. But suddenly, everybody say suddenly. Suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar, he jumped up in amazement and said, Didn't we tie up three men and throw them to the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, yeah. Well, be nice to you, whatever you want us to say, yes, we don't want to die. And verse 25, well, look, Nebuchadnezzar said, I see four men unbound walking around in the fire, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god, or one uh, translation says like a son of God. Now, scholars believe, and, and I do as well, that was a Christophany. It was an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. You need to remember that Jesus wasn't born. He is God. He is the author. All things were made by him, and he is the author of all the scripture, and he showed up in the fire with those that were honored the Lord. The Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door, the flaming furnace, and said, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God. He's beginning to have a moment thinking, okay, I really messed up. He said, come on out. Come out here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they stepped out of the fire. The high officers, officials, governors, advisors crowded around them and saw the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was even singed, and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. How many of you have ever been to a barbecue before? Come on, just wave at me. It doesn't matter how hard you try, you know you're going to smell like meat the rest of the day. That's a beautiful smell, isn't it? (laughs) How many of you would buy cologne? Yeah, that flavor. There's something about a barbecue, but the Bible says they're in the midst of the fire and the burning. They did not even smell like smoke. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted him. They defied the king's commands and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any God except their own. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever the race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they'll be torn limb from limb. He was a pleasant guy, wasn't he? It's like, I'm going to burn you, rip you apart, and, you know, yeah, anyway. And their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble, just in case you're wondering. Uh, you need to serve their God because there's no other God who can rescue like this. One more verse. Then the king promoted. Everybody say promoted. promoted. See, the opposite of the story, you're thinking, okay, they're going to die for their faith and they're willing to do it. But that's actually not what happened. They were persecuted for their faith, but God promoted them in this moment. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. Are you ready? Turn to your neighbor and tell them it's about to get slap your mama good. Come on, let's tell them that right now. If that's offensive to you, tell the other neighbor, slap your papa good. (laughs) First Corinthians 6 says, be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything in love. In Ephesians 6, it says, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. And we'll talk about standing firm by the Holy Spirit and what that means uh, next week. And then we're going to do a whole series on love, marriage, baby carriage uh, throughout February. And we got a lot of things coming up. But I want to give you a prophetic word uh, to bother you as necessary, to challenge you to think through, because I want to encourage you to be steadfast in your faith. You don't need to be moved. You don't need to be shaken. You don't need to be in fear, but you need to be in reverence of the Lord and honoring him. How to be steadfast in your faith. Because the the world will continue to put pressure to influence you. To take what you know is true so that you'll begin to believe the lie so that you can be accepted by others. Uh, It was a number of years ago. My kids were little 
And uh, I've shared this before, but it's just a great story. Uh, my wife, I was overwhelmed, and I just said, you know what? We got kids in diapers. We got, we have five kids. We had like all ages. I said, honey, I got it tonight. I'm going to take care of dinner. Now, she's probably thinking like, good, finally. And I'm thinking like, who's... A parade in my honor, please. I finally, you know, help. And so I'm like, I'm going to take care of dinner, which meant I'm going to call and order some pizza. Come on. So like, yeah. And so I did that, and I went to go get the pizza. And when I went there, they had messed up the order, but we only had a short period of time uh, to get, I don't remember exactly, but I had to hurry up, get the food. We were going somewhere, and they, and they said, we messed it up, but do you still want this? I'm like, not a big deal. They said, has anchovies on it. I'm like, not a big deal. I don't even know what they are, because I've never eaten them before, because seafood is disgusting to me and I just never had it on my pizza because who would ruin perfectly good pizza with anchovies? Who would do that? Come on, just wave at me. Yeah. And, and so I, I didn't even realize that they were fish. And so I said, no big deal. I'll take it home. I'll just take the fish off and, you know, or the anchovies. No big deal. And so I went home. I never told her. I took everything off. It's all fine. Cheese pizza. And all the kids, everybody gathered. They began to eat. And they began to complain. There's something wrong with this pizza. I'm like, no, it's not. It's cheese pizza. It's fine. They're like, no, it's not fine. It tastes terrible. It tastes like fishy. <laughs> and I kind of looked up and, you know, kind of figured out that anchovies were like fishy and gross and nasty. And finally, my wife's like, hey, what did you, you know, do to the pizza? I'm like, I didn't do anything, but I did. I thought if I just, you know, took it off and like you wouldn't notice. Now think about that for a moment. You're cooking fish on top of a pizza. How many of you know that's probably going to get into the cheese and to the dough? That's probably going to influence the taste and the experience that you have. I share that with you because many of us, uh, if we're not careful, we begin to believe that I can think like the world thinks, I can act like the world, I can live like the world, but it's not going to get any, on the inside of me, it's not going to affect me, it's not going to affect my children, it's not going to affect the future. And I'm here just to, to, to declare to you, to talk to you, and to prophesy over you, to encourage you, and to challenge you that God has called you to be steadfast and to live different. You are not called to bow your knee to the gods of this day and this age, to the opinion of men, and to the things that we see permeating culture. You're called to stand strong, live different, and declare the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God that still sets people free. It still heals body. It still opens up blinds eyes. It still uh, casts out demons. It still raises dead people out of their sin. It's still true. And so how do you stand st steadfast? How do you, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the midst of your cultural moment that looks different than a few thousand years ago, but it's the same spirit of Babylon or anti-Christ spirit that's alive and active today that knows better than God, has its own way to heaven, and declares that you will worship the opinions and ideas of men and not of the one true God. In this cultural moment, the question is, will you Stand. How do you stand steadfast? Well, very simply, number one, write this down or put a notepad on your, on your smartphone. Accept God's word as your authority or as your final authority. Uh, going back to verse 12, it says, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you put in charge of the province of Babylon which is so interesting when you go back to the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11, the spirit down through the age, it says, they refuse to worship your gods and the, the gold statue that you have set up. We live in a culture that wants you to worship self and it wants you to worship uh, and be an idolatry. And the idolatry of our day is ideology. Now, if you've been around, you've heard a lot of these things before, but I'm going to go through it again because I think it's so incredibly important. We live in a generation that's known as the woke generation. Now, for some, that positive means you're enlightened. Uh, we call it Gnosticism, the ancient mystery religions that the Bible talks about in the New Testament that were infiltrating the church that knew something more than God. 
that same spirit is still alive and happening today. And it says, well, this is how you're enlightened about history, about racism, about economics, and, and it divides everyone to the oppressed or the oppressor, and you're not guilty of sin, you're just guilty of privilege, and you don't repent of your, uh, of your sin and be made new, you repent of it the rest of your life, and you'll always be found guilty in some way, shape, or form. Now, this particular theory that's permeated our culture from the World Economic Forum to the United Nations to the local classroom to your workplace is something that's called critical theory. Critical theory may not be interesting, and you want me to move on to another topic, but you need to know about it because it is uh, the ideology that's seeping into your mind and your heart, and you're, you are affected by it whether you realize it or not. Critical theory is simply this. It's an antichrist theory. It goes against, it's inspired by Karl Marx. Uh, it's a political philosophy that came out of the Frankfurt School in Germany. And I don't want to get too technical and keep it a little bit high level, but we do have these books we've given out for years. One by Dr. Erwin Lutzler called No Reason to Hide. If you'd like to know the details of some of these things I'm mentioning and where we're headed in the future, he writes with uh, prophetic accuracy. Critical theory is a contemporary viewpoint. That looks at life all through the lens of power. Uh, it's, uh, it divides everyone by race, class, gender, sexuality, orientation, age, and so on. You're like, okay, I don't, uh, I don't get it. So if you, are, uh, if you are in any way a minority, you're instantly oppressed. And if you're in any way a uh, majority, you're instantly the, per- the oppressor and guilty. And you may say, well, how does that work itself out? Let me show you some pictures real quick, and then I'll uh, talk to you about it just for a few moments today. Got to bring that up, guys. So uh, I post this in my story. I post a lot of my stories on social media about these issues because I want you to be aware because most people, they're busy with life. They don't pay attention to these things. Um, So I just want you to to know what's happening. So they say, hey, there's not enough representation of uh, trans kids and, uh, and babies that are LGBTQ. If you don't believe that that's true, Harvard actually has a class teaching pediatricians of how to identify uh, gay children and sexualized kids. So they now have uh, Fisher Price promoting drag queen toys for kids because it's not enough to talk to adults. It's not enough to target teenagers. We need to, to target preschool kids who think nothing of sexuality and try to teach them sexual things and rob them of their innocence. And I love this post. It just said, don't destroy the innocence of ch- childhood to validate insecure and sick adults. I say that without equivocation, without apology. If that's you and you hold to that view that that's somehow normal, Jesus loves you and he wants to set you free from the demons that have deceived you. There, there's another thing that came out uh, this past week that was uh, a bit interesting. And this comes from critical theory. And there's lots of offshoots of this. I'm not gonna do, it's not a seminar for that today. But I just want you to understand how this works itself out. This came out this past week from John Hopkins, sent to everybody. Uh, and some of you may work for John Hos- Johns Hopkins, so you may have gotten this. And they said, hey, just wanna let you know that if you're a male, white, Christian, middle-aged, able-bodied, middle-owning class, or English-speaking, like you're the problem. And so just be aware heading into, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. uh, Day and Black History Month and all those things that you are the problem. Now, we used to think that like Martin Luther King Jr. would say, hey, we're going to be judged by the content of our character, not the color of our skin. But the Marxist philosophy is the opposite. And it's growing acceptance with Christians who feel guilty. It's going to an acceptance in every facet of life. So people are like, hey, whatever, whenever you tell me to bow my knee, Whenever you tell me to post my pronouns in my bio, I'll do it. Whatever you tell me to do, like, I'm just going to go along, and I'm just going to do that. It's not a big deal. And whatever you mandate, like, I'll do that, because I just love everybody and love everything. And the reality is, is you cannot love God and the ideologies of the day, because there's no such thing as love as love. Let me prove it to you. If if a 70-year adult tries to love and have sexual relations with a six-month-old child, we would say death penalty. So we say there is a limiting principle. God defines love in very practical ways, and everyone, say everyone. Everyone Everyone believes that there's a limiting principle. But we don't want to be offensive to our neighbor. 
But God says, I've actually come to divide and call you to repentance. The same ideologies that they were getting people to bow their knee to thousands of years ago uh, is still happening. It's still happening today. In fact, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, said, you know what? We need to change the narrative that not only is it okay for you to chemically castrate your children uh, so that they'll uh, never be able to be sexually satisfied, they'll always be confused, and then to treat them like Frankenstein and ruin their bodies the rest of their lives at a, at a young age before they can even uh, get a tattoo or be in legal age to drink alcohol. Not only is it okay, but if you don't go along with that, it's actually child abuse. That is what is coming. You may say, Sam, you're just too far out there. And this is, and you may say, hey, you may say it's ridiculous. I'm just saying, you and I have a decision to make. We're either really gonna love people or we're gonna be silent and let people get really hurt by the lies of culture in the day. And I just made a decision. I could be canceled. I could be persecuted. I don't care. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. I love you enough to let you know that if you're gonna be sexually fulfilled, it's gonna be God's way. If you're gonna be fulfilled, it's because you're a man or a woman. If you're gonna be fulfilled, it's not because you're bowing your knee at the, the moment the music plays and the culture will always clap for you. They'll cheer for you. But God and all of heaven will celebrate the day that you say, I love God too much and I love my family and the people in my world too much to lie, to pretend I'm standing strong, I'm standing up, and I'm honoring the Lord my God. And I realize, I realize that that's really tough for some. It's really tough uh, when we say, hey, there's, there's two genders. Gender is a made-up word. There's two sexes. God created male, female. Everybody knows that. The reality is, is that it's true. We're made in his image. And you may be confused by that today. And I just want you to know that confusion is not from God. It's from the enemy. And you can be free. You'll never find freedom pretending something that you're not. But you'll always find freedom when you refuse to bow your knee to self and you humble yourself before God and you let him change you, forgive you, and give you his grace. You won't find freedom by posting your pronouns in your bio and going along and pretending that someone is God and you're God and you can recreate yourself in whatever, whatever image you want that to be. There are no other gods before him, including your opinion. And if you come to God, he can save you. He can set you free. See, idolatry is self-worship and it's wrong. In Colossians 2.8, it says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the element, uh, elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than Christ. This is nothing new. It's the same spirit. It's the same ideologies at war against God. My challenge to you this morning is that you just determine, I'm not just gonna go along to get along. I'll never hate anyone and I'll never love anyone more than God. I bow my knee to the Lord, and I may be canceled, you may be thrown into fire, but God will always be with you. In Hebrews chapter four, it says, the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, it exposes our inmost thoughts and desires. Deuteronomy 4.2 says, do not add to or subtract from these commands I'm giving you. Just obey the commands of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today. Revelation 22, if anyone removes any of the words from the book of prophecy, God will remove that person from the tree of life in the holy city described in this book. It's a very, listen, I share this with you today, not in a goal that you will like me, but you, that you'll be prepared for heaven. One day, sooner than you think, you'll cease uh, sucking oxygen on this planet, and you'll stand before God, and you'll live at a place of your choosing. And at that time, when you stand before the Lord, all the cultural pressure, all the social media campaigns, everybody trying to shame you, you're a homophobe, you're a racist, you're this, you're that, whatever it is, and if you are, then repent of those things, but more than likely, it's just being used to manipulate you in this moment. I just wanna encourage you, Fear God, keep his commands, because at the end of it all, that's the only thing that will really matter. Make your decisions based on the word, not based on the world. 
Uh, second thought, quickly, stand for your faith regardless of the pressure around you. They, they said, you know what? You can throw us into the furnace. You can have your angry face. You can have, you know, your angry eyebrows. And, and you can say, I'm not really happy with you. And you're a bigot. And you're this. And you're all these things. You can do the name calling thing. But listen, I'm not honoring you over God. I'm not changing the reality because you're distorting it. I'm holding fast to what is true. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 13, 8, that we must always stand in the truth. It's our responsibility as believers to never oppose truth, but to stand for it at all times. We can be steadfast in our faith. We can say, you know what? God said it. I believe it. That settles it. There's lots of proof and, 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 you know, about the existence of God, and I could give you uh, theology and philosophy. I think that's incredibly convincing because without the truth of God, you, you can't know or believe anything. But at the end of the, the, end of the day, you just have to make a decision. Do I believe God or not? Like, do I believe that God created? Because if I did, then I'm made in his image. God, you, you made my inmost, uh, most delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Next week's Right for Life Sunday, where some churches will talk about it. Most churches will be silent. They'll only talk about the cultural issues that are acceptable to the culture because of fear and cowardice. But I'm sharing with you today, we unapologetically stand for life at all phases because it's God's idea and they're precious to the Lord. They have no voice, no one to stand for them. We will stand for them. We will be loud, we will be proud, we will sow thousands of dollars into, uh, into all the crisis pregnancy centers. We will help those that find themselves at, uh, in wedlock, out of wedlock, in a struggle and say, we're standing with you because what God has placed within you is a treasure. And not an accident, but from Almighty God. We believe the marriage bed should be honored by all. We don't get to redefine it. The Bible's really clear with that. So don't bring pornography into the marriage bed. Don't bring another person into the marriage bed. Don't bring the world into the marriage bed. It will, it will not fulfill you. It will leave you empty. Honor the Lord and he will bless you. In John 7, 13, it said, no one had courage to speak favorably about Jesus in public. Acts 18, 9, it said, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, said, don't be afraid, keep on speaking. Do not be silent. You have to make a decision. Are you gonna have a worldview that's based on the world or based on the word? On the world, it'll shift. Culture will change. All of a sudden, those words don't mean those things. And you're actually living through a cultural revolution based on Marxism and communism, which has brought about the death of more than 100 million people in the last 100 years. It's a sick, twisted ideology that is deceitful, and it's antichrist. It's the spirit of Babylon in our day. And I'm challenging you, stop being good with it. Stop pretending to be nuanced. Stop signing something that you know isn't true. Stop acting like something, stop lying to your kids because you're scared they, they, they might be upset with you. Stop lying to uh, the people in your world because you just want to go along and make sure that you get a raise and that this happens. God knows how to promote you even in Babylon. Just ask, this ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God can bless you in your obedience. Here's what I'm saying, love everyone. Love God first. Because if you don't love God first, you'll never love other people appropriately or accurately. Two declarations I want to encourage you to be steadfast in. I will not bow to, and I will not bow when. I will not bow to the pressures of this day, the lies of the culture, the shaming that we're seeing. I will not bow when they turn up the heat. It doesn't matter. I don't care what the world does. We live in a day and an hour where, uh, just imagine, some 60 years ago, uh, six million Jews sent to the incinerator with their family and killed while the world sat by silent. And we all have seen the movies and all these things. We said, well, that would never happen again. 
Yet we see in the streets of Washington, D.C. last night, tens of thousands of people chanting essentially that very thing. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. What does that mean? No more Jews. And yet the church and people are like, well, you know, you just got to understand it's really nuanced. And actually, I just want to let you know, it's really not. Like, we, ought, we, we stand with the Jewish people. They're still in covenant with God. They're still loved with God. They may be 15 million people of 7 billion people on the planet, but that's still the epicenter of the entire world. And world peace hinges on this piece of property that's so tiny, on this small group of people, just like the Bible prophesied would happen in these days. Can I challenge you to awaken? Can I challenge you to arise? To not give in to the spirit of the age? I not, will not bow to and I will not bow when. Colossians 1.23 says, you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you've received when you heard the good news, the good news preached all over the world. That, <clears throat> that Paul, I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. Last two thoughts. Stand in faith no matter the circumstances. Anything that can be shaken will be shaken. I don't want to scare you. My goal is to get you steadfast in the word of God. The last couple of years have not been accidental. They're intentional. We're living in a prophetic timeline. And what can be shaken will be shaken. You don't have to fear. God wants you and I to stand strong. Because there's a world around you that wants to know that God's word is true that needs to know that there's a God in heaven that loves them. No matter what their struggle may, may be, God doesn't affirm them, say, it's okay, it's not a big deal. It actually is a really big deal. So much so, God sent his one and only son to die on a cross for that sin that separates us from God so that we could call to him and find grace and mercy in our time of need. You just make a decision. No matter how hot the fire may get, you're going to stand firm in the Lord, your God. Last thought, make a decision to believe that you will see God's plan accomplished through your life. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had no idea. They were just young, uh, young men at this point, maybe 14, 15 years of age, that they were in a foreign land and being told that everything that you believe is wrong. And they're like, no, it's not. We know that God is real. We know that his word is true. We know that our God saves. And they're like, no, it doesn't. Shut up. We're gonna kill you unless you agree with us. Spirit of Babylon. That spirit is alive and well today. And you and I have a decision to make. Do you want God to accomplish his plan through your life? Or will you bow down in fear and give up your destiny? My challenge to you is that you stand up in faith. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had no idea when they refused to bow how that would work out. They were like, our destiny maybe is to you know, be barbecued and go to heaven. That's all good. We're going to heaven. We'll be there a lot longer. But God saw fit to save them in the midst of the flames. I don't know what you may be going through, but you don't have to bow to your emotion. You don't have to bow to the opinion of this day. Think of what they said. They said, God can deliver us. He will deliver us. But even if he doesn't in the way that we think, I know that God, we're gonna trust in him. When I was talking to my mama yesterday, as my adopted sister who has had health issues her entire life went to be with the Lord, my mom's cared for her for decades. My mom is weeping. She wept with the Spirit, God, I know that you could have healed her, and I know that you will heal her, but even if you don't do it in the way that I wanted you to, I still trust you. And we talked about how good God is, how she's healed, how she's whole. See, you're always gonna have an opportunity to deny the Lord based on your circumstance. I'm gonna encourage you, make a decision that you won't do it. God can deliver us, he will deliver us, and even if he does not answer our prayers in the way that we think he should, he is God and we will trust him. Would you stand with me as we close? The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, it says, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. I want you to know that faith that is tested is a faith that can be trusted. And you may be here today and saying, Sam, my faith's been tested, man, but like when the pressure's on, like I've just cowered. 
I just want to let you know, it doesn't matter what you've done. It matters today what you're going to do from this point on. When your heart says, you know what, I know God's word says that, and I know it's right, but I just feel like I really want to do this, and I want God to be okay with it. And in your heart, you know that he's not. Life is a window of time to find God and then the judgment. I, I'm encouraging you today. I know this is an intense prophetic message. My challenge to you is Satan is playing the music of the day. The church in so many ways is silenced, even in, even in support of the Jewish people. Who would have thought that would be the case? There's so much pressure in this day to go along with things that you know in your heart don't make sense, even if you've been going along with them. And today I unapologetically call you to repentance, to stop fearing man and stop obeying your opinion and begin obeying the Lord your God, that same God that placed you in your mother's womb, that same God that sent Jesus to die for you, that same God that's gonna come back and fulfill every prophecy in this book, that same God loves you and it's not too late for anyone. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, you can experience the grace and the mercy of God. So here's my closing thought. Come on, bring it up, guys, if you would. Be steadfast in your faith by accepting God's word as your final authority, standing firm regardless of the pressure around you, no matter the circumstance, while believing that you will see God accomplish his plan in and through your life. You're a person of destiny. I don't care what your age is, what season of life you're in. You may feel all alone. You may feel like you've done uh, too many things wrong. God's finished with you. You may be steeped in the, in the sin and in the insanity of the things I'm talking about. I don't care where you are. You're never too far from the grace and the love and the mercy of God. And today, online and in the house, if you're ready to get right with God, there's a very real Savior that loves you. There's a very, very real Savior. His name is Jesus. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whosoever would believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone has sinned. Our sin is first against God before it's against another person. The wages of those sin is death. Someone has to pay the price. We will stand before the living God. But the gift of God, hear me, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's what we're all about, freedom and life. That we are hope dealers bringing the grace and the mercy of God. So stop apologizing for truth that may be offensive. It may be that offense that needs to shake and awaken someone from their slumber to come to the grace and mercy of God. And if you're going to be concerned with offending, be first concerned with offending the living God before another person because he's ultimately the Savior. The Bible says that if we call on the name of the Lord, we'll be saved. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we believe in our hearts, we'll be saved. Would you bow your heads with me today? Online, in the house, if you're here today and say, you know what? I need to get right with God. Maybe you feel like, man, I'm so far away from God or you've never made the decision to follow Jesus before and this is new for you, but you feel something on the inside. You know I'm not speaking with the authority. I'm just a, I'm a wee little man. I'm just a little bald preacher doing his best. But the authority and the power of the Word of God is alive and you feel it and you know it today. So today I call you out of your sin and I call you home. Come home to the grace and the mercy of Almighty God. Maybe you've made the decision to follow Jesus, but you haven't been living that way. Maybe you've been cowering in fear and just going along with the mandates of the moment. But today you say, you know what? I'm going to be steadfast. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'm going to stand strong. I don't know where you are today, but if you're here today online, in the comment section, I just want you to put, that's me. And I want to pray with you today. And if you're here in the house, I'm just going to, I'm going to ask you in just a moment, just to lift up your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it. I'd love to pray with you today as we get right with God. God bless you. God bless you. If that's you, just lift up your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it. I want to pray with you today. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. You're here today. This may be bothering you. 
but something on the inside of you knows that it's true. I want to challenge you. I came with a full intention today of bothering you, shaking you, offending you, whatever it takes to get you to come home to the love and the grace and the mercy of God before Jesus returns. He's coming back and we need to be ready. And if that's you and you need to get right with God today, don't wait another moment. Don't wait another second. If that's you, lift up your hand high enough and long enough for me to see and say, Sam, I'm ready. I need to get right with God. I need His grace. I need His mercy. God bless you, sir. Anybody else online, you can put, that's me. Today, a holy revival and awakening is starting in our lives. Come on, are you ready? Would you pray with those that have raised their hand? Join with me. Everybody say, Jesus, today I choose to follow you. Forgive me of my past. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me and make me new. I believe that you died on a cross, that you rose to new life, and you're coming back again for me. And until that day, I will live for you right now by faith. I'm a child of God, forgiven and free in Jesus' name. I am steadfast in faith. Amen. Whether you raised your hand or not, online and in the house, if you just prayed that prayer in faith, the Bible says you just got born again. Your past is forgiven. Your future is secure. Come on, Freedom Life. The Bible says, oh, heaven celebrates when one person turns from their sins. Come on, we rejoice in that, in Jesus' name. Come on, how many of you are ready to stand? You're ready to stand and be bold, be full of love, and be a light in the midst of darkness, that you're not going to hate anybody, you're going to stand in truth, but you're not going to cower in fear, you're not going to allow manipulation to get you to obey things that are not true, and you're going to bring an awakening revival to your home to your workplace and everywhere that you are. You're called of God. Father, I thank you for the people of God. This week, divine appointments. Divine appointments to share your grace and mercy that are about to set people free. Lord, I declare and I speak, Lord Jesus, that you would release supernatural dreams and visions over the hearts of every person at the sound of my voice. You're not finished with us. With us. I just prophetically just speak. There's, I think there's, uh, there's more than one. I know it's general, but I just felt inclined. You feel like, you know what, I'm too far, my life is just, I'm, I, I'm stuck, and I don't know that there's any more, and I just feel hopeless, and I just want to let you know that God led you in this moment. God is the God of hope, and your greatest days are out in front of you. As you obey, and you honor, and you fear the Lord, the best is yet to come. I speak it over you, in Jesus' name, amen.